Linda George. And I'm Adrian Cohen. So how did you become interested in gerontology? Well, I think several factors um, played into that. First of all, I was very close to my maternal grandparents. And I thought they were very, very wise and loving. And frankly, they were wiser and more loving than my own parents. So I really wanted to be like them. And I all they had very little education, very rural immigrants from Switzerland. Uh, and spoke English fine, but with, you know, a decided accent that my parents didn't have. And I always, as a kid, I, I, I wanted to figure out how to be like them. And how did they get to be they, the way they were? Because they seemed very different to me than, than most people. Mm -hmm. So that kind of interested me in aging to begin with. But I don't think that alone would account for it. My undergraduate work was at Miami University, and my first year as a freshman was Bob Ashley's first year as an assistant professor. Mm. And I had him for intro soc. I loved the course. I loved him as a professor and decided I was going to take everything that he taught. And among those courses was, to my understanding, one of the first courses in social gerontology in the United States and he of course ended up writing the first textbook in the field and his enthusiasm and just just him as a, as a role model I found extraordinarily attractive and so I certainly became very identified with sociology during my undergraduate degree and to some extent gerontology but I was just going to get a college degree, first in my family. After I graduated, um, I took a job in that same county where Miami is as a caseworker for neglected and abused children, other end of the life course. And um, all through my undergraduate years, uh, Bob and Millie Seltzer, mm -hmm. who was also one of my mentors there, and Fred Cottrell, who was one of my mentors there, they all said, you have to go to grad school. You need to go to grad school. I said, no. I'm going to get a college degree. That's, that's a great thing for me. That's enough. Believe it or not, in my third year on the job, Bob Ashley shows up at my office and says, you are going to graduate school. We've arranged for it. You're admitted. You'll get a stipend. And um, even then, I wouldn't have done it, except that I was able to get a leave of absence. I was so from the from my job. I was so security conscious that I wasn't going to just go have a great year if I didn't have a job to go to. And it was a wonderful year. Mm -hmm. And I ended up not going back to my job because these wonderful people at Miami. The minute I got there for the master's degree, it's you got to apply to a PhD program because Miami didn't have a PhD program. No, this will be fine. This is all I need. And all you can do with the PhD is be a professor. And I couldn't stand up in front of a class. I couldn't tolerate that. I'm fine one on one, but I'd be too nervous. And they convinced me to do a year teaching and decide if, in fact, that was something I could do. I ended up loving it, absolutely loving it. And so during that year I applied to graduate school and I accepted a, a, a fellowship at Duke University working with George Maddox and that was certainly going to be aging. Mm -hmm. So really it's it was the guidance I received initially at my undergraduate institution and then working with one of the most dynamic men in aging anybody can even imagine. Mm, that's great. So this one kind of builds on that, which is can you describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist? So you've gone, at this point you've gone through the graduate... I've gone through grad school, mm -hmm. absolutely. So that's the early part of my trajectory. Mm -hmm. After grad school, I did, a, I did a postdoc actually at Duke and had decided I was not going to leave this wonderful, beautiful area. And after the two-year postdoc, I accepted a faculty position at Duke. Not in sociology, 
they would not hire their own at that point, which is very common. And, but I was very, I have always been so lucky. I, I don't know how, but I have attracted people to me who just went out of their way. And I was hired in the Department of Psychiatry in a tenure track position. And I was told that it's extraordinarily hard for a PhD in a medical setting. Um, they're the real docs, you know. And I guess that's true, but I had the most supportive chairman you can imagine. And at the time when colleagues in grad school were coming up for tenure in departments of sociology all across the country, I had been tenured for three years, promoted and tenured, three years after joining the faculty. Mm -hmm. And four years after that, they promoted me to full. Mm -hmm. I had to generate 100% of my salary, that's how it is, in a private med school. and the real docs, as they call themselves, do so primarily by clinical income. Mine had to be all research income. Again, I was lucky. I, I hit big ones, a couple big ones, early in my career. It was extraordinarily exciting to be there. Um, I worked always collaboratively. I'm not much of an independent scholar, to be honest with you. Um, I enjoy interacting with others. I think they that we generate better ideas that way and I love learning from people in other disciplines. So um, rather than being a sociologist who kind of likes preaching to the choir, meaning my own peers, my disciplinary peers, I love to be put on the spot and I love a geneticist or a biologist or a gastroenterologist mm. to say to me in essence, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And then I like to tell them why I'm there and convince them that it's worth having somebody like me sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. So I had 15 incredibly exciting years mm -hmm. doing that. Then I got ready for somewhat of a change. Uh, first of all, I had loved teaching the time I'd done it, and I missed that a lot. And second, the rat race of supporting yourself 100% on grants is incredibly stressful. Mm -hmm. So I'd been out long enough, and I'd, I guess, done well enough that the sociology department at Duke invited me to move my primary appointment there, and I did. And I've been there ever since. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you arts and sciences is a totally different world than the medical center for the last 15 years, I have not had anybody say, so how are you going to pay yourself this year? My salary is a given. I continue to do a fair amount of research, but teaching is, has increasingly become the focus of my attention. And for the last five years, I've had the uh, luxury of only teaching graduate students. And that's just terrific. It's a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and you know a lot of mentoring which was what I love mm -hmm. and so now I've got a, more than 30 grad students who I've supervised they're all over the country teaching at a variety of institutions and that's pretty much my career trajectory that's great. Um, at what point in your career did you uh, embrace gerontologists to describe yourself? Never. Mm -hmm. I do not describe myself as a gerontologist. Many people call me a gerontologist. I don't object, I don't rant and rave and say I'm not one of those, because I think by most definitions I, I probably am. Mm -hmm. But I have always described myself as a sociologist who studies aging. Mm -hmm. And in terms of embracing aging, I mean I've done that since the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. um, my dissertation was on aging. Um, the vast majority of my research has been either longitudinal looking at aging as a process. Much of it is also focused specifically on the latter part of life. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly define myself and identify as an aging researcher. But I really think sociologist comes, comes first in my identity. Mm -hmm. um, those are the tools, those are the theories, those are the methods that I bring 
to studying the life course and especially the last end or the final the final part of the life course um, as I say I don't object to being called a gerontologist mm -hmm. um, but my own identity is a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, I think many people would say you know what's the diff maybe there isn't much difference you know but at least in terms of my own identity I d identify as a sociologist but always from the get-go a sociologist of aging mm -hmm. So you mentioned one, um, but I'm going to come back to this, um, about uh, female mentors. Can you tell me about some of the female mentors who um, impacted you, you in, your, in your work, in your field, and um, who were they, how did they impact you, that kind of stuff? I basically, I had very, I had very limited access to female mentors. Mm -hmm. I would say Millie Seltzer was my only female mentor, but I had incredible mentorship. Uh, Bob Ashley at Miami, as well as Millie, absolutely. Mm -hmm. George Maddox and James House at Duke in my PhD program. Keith Brody, the chairman of psychiatry who hired me, told me I could make it there, mm -hmm. facilitated my career. I've had wonderful mentorship. Um, for whatever reason, um, in my undergraduate sociology department, and it was the same faculty for my master's degree there, there were only two faculty mem women faculty members in sociology. Mm -hmm. One of them was Millie. Mm -hmm. And the other one was uh, a woman who actually taught social work courses, and rather than sociology courses per se. Mm -hmm. When I came to graduate school at Duke, there was only one female faculty member in the sociology department mm -hmm. and she did not study aging or medical issues which is a, a, a big interest of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, she studied occupations particularly people selecting occupations in early adulthood so there wasn't a lot of common interest there. Mm -hmm. So where I was I did not really have female mentors. Mm -hmm. Now, the Gerontological Society introduced me to some very wonderful and impressive women in aging. Mm -hmm. And George Maddox was wonderful. When we went to GSA, he, I was with him. He introduced me to everybody. So among the people I met and I think became close to um, and received some mentoring at a distance were people like Elaine Brody. Uh, later she and I served on a study section together. We always shared a room. Mm -hmm. um, Helena Zanyeki Lopata. I knew her quite well. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a number of women that I became acquainted with professionally mm -hmm. but who were not mentors in the day-to-day kind of way. They were more role models, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. Role models who I met and was able to interact with enough to really observe them as role mm -hmm. models, but not, not the people who sat there and, you know, went over my computer output with me or listened to a job talk or a presentation, but more role models. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's very different now. Yeah. There had been very few, just a couple, uh, women presidents of GSA when I was elected, mm -hmm. um, which was in 1990. I guess was elected in 93, took mm -hmm. office in 94. Since there's been since then, there's been quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, so things have changed quite rapidly. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to say, mm -hmm. and I think women are extraordinarily well represented in the GSA membership now, the GSA leadership now, um, study sections that you know, the people who make the judgments of grant applications, mm -hmm. it's been tremendous. Yeah. But to also give you another perspective, when I was um, promoted to full professor at Duke, I received a handwritten note from Dolores Burke, who was our EEOC, Equal Opportunity Officer at that time. Mm -hmm. And she said, congratulations, you are the ninth tenured full professor woman at Duke University. This was in the mid-80s. Mm -hmm. Ninth! Wow. 
if somebody would asked me to guess, I would have said, oh, I'm in the 40s, 50s, 9th. There was a full, another woman full professor who was a clinician in the psychiatry department, and I knew of her. She was not tenure track, so she didn't count. The Ida Harper Simpson, the one woman in sociology I told you who was there when I arrived, mm -hmm. she was one of the nine. Mm -hmm. She was before me, but nine. Mm -hmm. That is how rapidly things have changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope I've been able to be a mentor. The graduate students I supervise are approximately, you know, they pretty much pick us. Um, they've been approximately 50% women, 50% men. But I hope that, you know, I've been able to, to provide mentorship that wasn't available. But that doesn't mean I'm at all disparaging of the mentorship I received. I could not have been treated better by the men who so kindly just just supported me in every way. What do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? That's a good question. Um, I think women probably bring to the field a somewhat different perspective than men do. I don't think it's an accident that if you look at the caregiving literature, um, Steve Zara played an incredibly important role early on. Nonetheless, if you look at the articles, most of them are written by women. If you look at articles on the economics, you know, what's going on economically in late life, and the more macro you get, <clears throat> the more dominant I think you see more men's names. Um, I think that women bring different perspectives based on their life experience, and this does not mean that they, any more than men, allow their personal experiences to somehow intervene in the research process, but I think it generates different hypotheses about what might be worth looking at mm -hmm. in terms of the experiences of age and the experiences of aging. And so I think, I think women, I think that's very important. Um, I have focused a lot in my career on perceptions of well-being, happiness, depression, uh, and other mental health issues, some on caregiving. Um, I think that I am more likely to be drawn to those kinds of topics than male colleagues would be. So I, I think women bring a different sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's in a more important sensitivity than what men bring, mm -hmm. but it needs to be there. They're, they're both incredibly important. Um, for all that Duke, I think you cannot say that Duke was friendly to women if I was the ninth tenured full professor woman there. You can't say that it was a great breeding ground for women scholars. But personally, I have found it incredibly supportive. It is a rich university. The resources I have, the quality of the colleagues I have, the quality of the students that go there has been absolutely phenomenal, so I have found it a very fertile ground mm -hmm. for my scholarship. Um, and so I, I really don't know how to put those together. Yeah. That I feel I've done so well and been so lucky to be there, and many people, including you know people like Dolores Burke, the Equal Opportunity Officer, look and are horrified, not so much now, but in the 70s, 80s, were horrified by the fact that women were so few and far between and they basically didn't make it on average from the assistant professor position up the ladder. They hired a fair number of women, but mo the vast majority didn't get tenure and of those who did, the vast majority never made it to full. 
And so I don't know how you put those two things together. Um, but what I think it's taught me and what I try to tell my students, because, you know, graduate students face, they've got, I want to have children or I do have children. Um, yet I want to be uh, successful in my career, putting all these things together. And what I tell them is you can. If When I graduated from grad school, I was told, you can't get a job here at Duke. You have to go elsewhere. Well, I managed. And I, and I think I managed to do okay. Um, you can. You just, you can't let the way things have been determine for you how things are going to be for you. It's a bad job market. I tell my students, you only need one job. You'd have a heck of a time if you had to pick between five. Let's get you one. Um, you know, you don't like this first job, they'll come back to me. I'm not sure I belong here. Fine. Here's what it takes to move somewhere. Um, people just, you know, I think it's really important. Scholars are very smart people. They're very intelligent people. And you just got to believe that there are ways to make a pathway mm -hmm. for you mm -hmm. that will be rewarding. And it may not be the same pathway anybody else would take. Who cares? You're not anybody else. You're you. Mm -hmm. and, and I just would not be where I am had I not been encur not only encouraged, literally pushed, shoved, nudged. <laughs> worn down, okay, okay, I'll go to grad school. Uh, if people hadn't taken that kind of interest in me, mm -hmm. there there are no words. Mm -hmm. The, you know, kid came from a poor background, immigrant grandparents, nobody finished high school in my family. Mm -hmm. and And look at me. And, and but I could never have done it. I had, frankly, I had the skills to do it. I had the capacity to learn to do it. Mm -hmm. What I needed was people telling me, not only you can do it, you are going to do this. It is too much a waste if you don't do this. I can't help but feel that that must make you a very good mentor yourself. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Um, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Not as well as I'd hoped it would. <laughs> I think there have been some real benefits. Um, I'm close to 70. I'm 68. I'll be 68 in a few months. Um, I think one of the great things about being a gerontologist is especially if you do at least some of your own data collection. And I've been largely a big data set person, but I've also done studies where I did the interviewing. And you just it's just awesome. I mean, successful aging, as it's been called, is or aging well. It's the norm. It's not the exception. That doesn't mean that these people are, you know, running marathons and, you know, all that but they're finding meaning in life and they're interested in life and they're engaged with life and they are despite the fact that their resources physical perhaps financial often social because of that they still do it and they're they're just such wonderful role models so i think one of the great things about being a gerontologist is if you look at the data it's not bad to be an old person. Mm -hmm. It's not bad at all. Mm -hmm. And some of our most awesome citizens are amazing old people. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that being, in your words or in others' words, a gerontologist or an aging researcher is that I'm not entering old age with the thought that this is a horrible time in life. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Um, 
where it hasn't been as helpful as I would like is in terms of just dealing with primarily in physical issues. I'm pretty healthy. I mean, I get around, I can do everything. On the other hand, in the last five years, I've lost an eye, mm -hmm. totally, and had the other one has going around with four repairs, hoping that the I can keep a retina so that I can see something for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I don't have the energy I used to have. Mm -hmm. um, I should know that these things happen as a gerontologist, but as the aging research I've done has really not provided me with tools to really understand how it feels mm -hmm. and how it affects you, to begin to have the, the beginnings of some physical limitations. It really is true. I used to poo-poo as somebody who studies aging in my 30s and they'd say young people don't really understand um, physical decline, mortality. They think they're always going to be like this. I did. Mm -hmm. I did, even though I, I knew better intellectually in my heart of hearts. I, it, it, didn't, it didn't occur to me that I would have vision problems when I got older or, or those kinds of things. And... I guess the saving grace is I do know that millions of older people experience much worse than I've experienced, at least thus far, still find great meaning and great joy in life. But I haven't gotten a little, you know, here's how you do it, tricks of the trade, that I guess, guess I'd hope to avoid. You can't avoid them. And if we as aging researchers really enter in thinking what we're going to do, is allow people to avoid the experiences that go with aging or not. We can hopefully kind of minimize the consequences, find ways that people can compensate, but we're not going to change it. I also find myself attributing a lot of things to aging that I never thought I would. In my research, I've taken a pretty clear stance this isn't aging, this is disease. Mm -hmm. Or this isn't aging, this is sensory impairment. Or this isn't aging, this is loss of a social network. It's not that clear in your own life. Because those things are, it ex who cares? I mean, at the personal level, what does it matter whether this vision problem has anything to do with aging or it is a fact, a physical condition that is separate from that? cares it's I still have to deal with it and I do attribute it to aging and so I attribute attributing I find myself attributing in my own life things that tend to be correlated with aging mm -hmm. and say this is aging mm -hmm. and so in some ways I appreciate that the way academically we sometimes categorize things or split hairs or something when it comes to your own life that's not the important part. The important part isn't saying this is or is not age. The important part is, okay, once you experience this, what's the best you can make out of this? What's the least, least problems, the fewest problems that, this, that you can allow this to have in your life? Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it's made me have a much more practical eye, if you will not to making these theoretical distinctions, but to say, when it's all together, it's all together. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to deal with. Yeah. So the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. And within that framework, is there anything else that you'd like us to know? Well, uh, prob I think I probably said this, but just to be sure I'm clear, I think and hope that my research is somewhat of a legacy. Mm -hmm. I think it will be a time-limited legacy because of two things. First of all, and I see it because I've been in the field long enough, people feel the intense need to reinvent the wheel. So I think some of us have been in the field for a long time. 
listened to papers or seen papers and that seem to kind of project the idea here's something new and different we say well you know so and so did that 40 years ago or whatever but also time limited because the whole environment changes in which in, in which aging takes place mm -hmm. the cohorts are very different I, I don't think that we in gerontology or in social sciences in general we're not finding universal truths we are finding how context and individuals come together to affect things now. And we can get some idea as to how processes work, but our children's late life is going to be very different than our late life. And so I don't think we should kid ourselves that we are, we're doing it, we're finding universal or eternal truths. Mm -hmm. It's good enough that we're making sense out of what is now and, and kind of getting a, pull back and see these larger processes. The details obviously are going to change. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to think that the research I've done has some legacy potential, but I don't kid myself very appropriately. It should be relevant for a while, and then it should not be nearly as relevant. Mm -hmm. What I hope is my longtime legacy is the students I've mentored. As I said, I've got more than 30 out there teaching uh, across the United States and in two instances in Canada. They're going to affect students and do research for decades to come. Um, so I think they are my legacy. I think they've taught me as much as I've ever taught them. But I think together we have managed to um, have them out there excited about contributing to the field, excited about teaching their students, exciting them, seeing the light bulbs go on. Mm -hmm. I think and I hope that will be my legacy.